Welcome to First Southern. We are so glad that you're here with us today, and we hope that we can connect with you and discuss today's uh, service with you. Now, if you'd like to connect with us, maybe you've got questions about our church, or maybe you've got questions about your journey with Jesus. Uh, there are two ways that you can connect with us today. The first one is grab your device, text the word connects to 94000, or you can go to our website, fsbc.com cs.org and click on the contact us page. Uh, fill that out and we will have someone reach out to you this week. Uh, we would love the opportunity to connect with you. And so what I want you to do right now is go over to the chat or comments section uh, on today's service and drop us a good morning or hello and let us know you're there. Uh, we're looking forward to discussing the message and prayer and worship with you. Now, speaking of the message, today we're going to be talking about what what it means and what it should look like to serve Jesus. And so I hope that through today's worship and prayer and message that you go further in your journey with Jesus. So now will you join me as we go and worship him? Promises you 
What an amazing time of worship. And now it's time that we transition from worshiping the Lord through song into worshiping the Lord through prayer. And today I wanna lift up our children. Uh, This week, starting tomorrow, uh, our church will be hosting our annual VBS, which is short for Vacation Bible School. It is a week-long program where we bring children onto our campus, uh, we worship with them, we have great fun and activities, we eat and we teach the Bible to them and we tell them about Jesus Jesus and how Jesus brings life-changing hope into our lives. And so today, will you go with me as we pray to the Lord for our children and for Vacation Bible School this week? Join me in prayer. Almighty God, thank you. We thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done in each and every one of our lives. We thank you for Jesus and the life-changing hope that he brought when he died on that cross, shedding his blood to forgive us of our sins, to rescue us from our sins. But Lord, we thank you also that on the third day, he rose from the grave in victory over that sin and over death. And Lord, we pray this week for our children. Lord, first off, we want to thank you for our children, for children everywhere. They are a blessing in our lives. Your word promises that to us. And Lord, we thank you so much that you have blessed our church with so many children and for such, uh, with such a wonderful children's ministry. And Lord, we specifically lift up this week to you as we will be hosting our annual Vacation Bible School. Lord, we pray that through this week, through the worship and through the activities and fellowship and through the studying and discussing of God's word, we pray that you would do a mighty work. We pray right now that you would begin the process of softening the minds and hearts of every child that will be on our campus this week. We pray that you would help them to be prepared to to hear your word, to worship you, and to build relationships and friendships with, with other believers that will last a lifetime. Lord, we pray that you would help them to worship you in spirit and in truth, that as they come here on this campus, Monday through Friday this week, uh, that they will experience you through the worship. Lord, we pray that when your word is spoken and as they discuss your word in small groups, we pray that you would open their minds and their hearts to your truth, that through your Holy Spirit, their eyes would be opened to the the rescue, the salvation that Jesus alone can provide. And Lord, that their lives would be changed, that Lord, they would either for the first time come to know you and begin a journey with you, or if they already know you, that they would be inspired to go further in their journey with you. And so Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work in the lives of our children. We pray that you would bring children from all over. 
Lord, that it wouldn't be just children that are involved here at First Southern, uh, but there would be children here from all over this area that they could experience you and your rescue, your salvation. Lord, so that we can ultimately lead every generation to the life-changing hope that can only be found in Jesus. Again, we thank you for children. We thank you for the blessings they are in our lives and for the future that they bring. And Lord, we pray for this week that students, that children would come to know you and would grow further in their journey with you. We thank you again and we pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. As we continue our series in the church, I want you to take your Bibles or your apps and turn to Acts chapter six. Now, if you're not familiar with where the book of Acts is located, uh, here's what I would have you do. If you're in a physical Bible, open up to the table of contents. You'll find there that the Bible's broken up into two main sections, the Old and the New Testament. Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. So locate the New Testament, five books in is Acts, go to chapter six. If you're in an app, pull down the list of the books of the Bible and you'll find that Acts is about two thirds of the way down that list. So we're gonna be in Acts chapter six today. Now. As you're turning there, I wanna tell you about a summer that I spent. Uh, the summer was in 1998. I was a couple of years into college and I had the opportunity uh, to work with my college minister, a, a man named Buddy Young. Uh, we were working with the cast and crew of one of the largest outdoor productions in all of the United States. This was a group of young adults mostly uh, who dedicated most of their day and all of their evenings into this production. It was a seven days a week uh, production that took place. And so their uh, schedule was completely full, meaning that they had no, little to no access to church. Uh, they, they would get off at, at, in the wee hours of the morning and they would go back to work in early afternoon and there was no room uh, for church activity there. And so Buddy Young had this great idea to begin a ministry to this people group. Uh, and so around midnight, we would gather at a building and the cast and crew would begin showing up after they had finished their work uh, in the production. And we would hang out with them. We would provide a meal. Uh, we would provide activities and uh, opportunity to gather as a group to feel like a community. And we always had an opportunity to share the love of Jesus. During that summer, I distinctly remember watching Buddy as he would work with this people group and, and interact with them. But then I began noticing as I worked through the summer with him and helped him more and more with this particular ministry, I noticed just what all it was taking to make that ministry opportunity happen. I saw what servanthood looked like. You see, he would work during the day in his regular college ministry function. He would also work through the day planning activities uh, for this late night. Uh, he went so far as to go and make arrangements with the local movie theater to open up at 1 a.m. in the morning so that this group of cast and crew could see the latest summer movies. He would spend time with them, late night hours. I mean, uh, at this time, Buddy was probably in his 50s and he would stay up with the, the, these people, this cast and crew of this production till three or four o'clock in the morning. And then he would get up and do it all over again. He sacrificed so much to serve this group of people in the name of Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What does it look like to serve Jesus? Again, maybe a better question would be, what should it look like to serve Jesus? Well, luckily for us, today's account gives us a glimpse at what serving should look like. So take your Bibles or your apps and turn to Acts chapter six. We're gonna begin in verse one. Acts chapter six, beginning in verse one. And it says this, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose amongst the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. 
And so the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And catch what it says in verse 7, and the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of even the priests became obedient to the faith. So I want to paint a picture of what's taking place here in the early church. If, if you go back and look into Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, it tells us that thousands of people had become followers of Jesus, had become Jesus' disciples. And so the early church was this massive gathering of thousands and thousands of people. Uh, I could jokingly say that in today's terms, the early church would be considered a mega church. But the interesting thing about the way this church operated was that rather than just meeting together as thousands of people on like a Sunday morning, they would also go and meet together in small groups in homes all over the city of Jerusalem. So it was both a large church and a small church movement at the same time. Now, let me just say this as a side note, the size of a church does not determine that church's health. There are large churches that are healthy and God honoring, and there are large, large churches that are not healthy and, and not God honoring. And the same can be said uh, of small churches. There are small churches that are healthy and, and are doing the mission of Jesus. And of course, there are small churches that are not healthy and are not fulfilling the mission that Jesus has for them. The point is that the size does not determine the health or the mission. Basically, the health and the mission is determined by how the people are following God's word and fulfilling the mission that Jesus has for them. So the church in Jerusalem was very huge, very large, and very small at the exact same time. But with that size came difficulties. We find in verse one that the people have come to the apostles, the 12, and they're bringing a complaint. Now these 12 are the original 12 that followed Jesus minus one. Now Judas, if you know the story of Jesus and what happens uh, towards the end of his life, Judas, one of his 12 followers, uh, has fallen away, he has betrayed, and he has killed himself. And in the early church, Judas was then replaced by another man. So these 12 uh, are the original followers of Jesus. They're now called the 12 or called the apostles. And so the church was going through a difficult moment. There was a point of unhealthiness that was taking place. Now, we cannot gloss over what's happening here because the church in its size and in its function was neglecting a specific group of people. Basically what's happening is the church uh, was supporting everyone within uh, its fellowship, within its gathering. And so people were, were saying, my money doesn't belong to me. I'm giving it to the church so that the church can go and meet the needs of those uh, that are within the church and those that are without the church. And so the church was feeding widows and orphans and taking care of those in need. And basically what we find here is during that daily distribution of food to the widows, we find that the Hellenist widows were being overlooked in favor of the Hebrew 
widows. Now, let me give you the definition of what we're talking about when we say Hebrew and Hellenist. You see, all of these people in Jerusalem were more than likely Jewish people or were Jewish converts. But when we say Hebrew and Hellenist, we're talking about what language they would be speaking most of the time. You see, the Hebrew widows were speaking Aramaic or Hebrew, and the Hellenist widows were mostly speaking Greek. They could have been Greek citizens that had moved to Jerusalem and become followers of God, or they could have been Jewish people who had moved away for some reason and had moved back, but while they were away, they learned Greek and became accustomed to speaking the Greek language. And so, A lot is going on. There are these two groups of widows who are receiving helps from the church. And during the distribution of that food, that help, the the Hebrew women are getting food, but the Hellenist women, the widows, are not. The native Jewish people, either intentionally or accidentally, were showing favoritism to the Hebrew-speaking women rather than the Greek-speaking women. And of course, the Bible speaks against this. Uh, Go read the book of James. Uh, James 1.27 tells us about how we're supposed to be caring for widows and orphans. And then later on in the book of James, it tells us to show no favoritism to anyone for any reason. And so there is a serious problem taking place here. And, And let me just say this. Hear me clear, if the early church was guilty of neglecting uh, their responsibilities or neglecting a a particular people group, don't think for a moment that the modern church is immune to that same problem. You see, the warnings that James and many other writers in the Bible give us about not showing favoritism is something that we can all fall into. And so we must be cautious to be a church, whether this church or churches everywhere, we must be a gathering of people that never shows favoritism to any group, no matter what the reason, whether it be the language that they speak, uh, the way they look or smell, the, the race that they belong to, the background that they have, we are never allowed to show favoritism. So, I think this is encouraging though, uh, for, for one reason. If the apostles could mess up, we can mess up obviously, but the apostles weren't perfect. The apostles made mistakes just like we did. The early church made mistakes just like we as a church make mistakes. The church leaders, the apostles at that time didn't get everything right. And church leaders today don't get everything right. And so this should be encouragement. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to follow the example that's given here in this passage about what to do when we're not perfect. You see, the point is that the apostles recognized what was going on and they responded in a biblical way. They didn't ignore the problem. They didn't deny that the problem existed. They didn't make excuses or cast blame on someone else for the problem. They they took ownership. They recognized it. They put their own egos aside and they fixed the problem. And that's what we as a church should be doing as well. You so This actually goes back to something that we've been teaching in this sermon series for the last several weeks. The unity of the church is a top priority. It is. Uh, Look at what happens here. They fixed the problem that they saw here out of their obedience to Jesus and for the unity of the church. And I think that's important for us to recognize that we're called as well to to obey Jesus and seek unity. So that's what they did. But how did they go about fixing it? Well, simply put, they created a team. They looked, they gathered the church together and they said, you pick from among yourselves seven reputable men that are filled with the spirit, love the Lord and are responsible and put them in charge. 
And so they create this team. And, and if you read further into other books of the New Testament, we find that this team is the first time, the first reference to what we today call deacons. Now, the word deacon is interesting because deacon is not actually a truly English word. It's a Greek word that's been played with to create an English word. You see, the New Testament in the, the last one third of this book was written in the Greek language originally. And so what the translators of the Bible did is they took the Greek word diakonos. I probably butchered that Greek, but they took the Greek word diakonos, diakonos, and they took that word and transliterated, in other words, put English letters on top of the Greek to create a new English word. Diakonos became deacons. But what does diakonos in Greek actually mean? Well, that word in Greek actually means, it is the Greek word for servant or for minister. And so a deacon is simply put a servant or a minister to a specific people. They're not necessarily a director or a leader of the church or a decision maker. They're much more a lead servant. So let me be clear here. Being a deacon is not about having a meeting or having a title. A deacon is about, being a deacon is about serving the body of Christ. It's about being a minister in the areas that the pastors and other ministers can't get to because of their responsibilities. Look with me again at verse four. So the apostles are speaking right here in verse four and listen to what they said. But we, the apostles, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In other words, the apostles are saying, we, our role, our job is to be the prayer warriors and to be the speakers, the ministers of God's word to the people. And so they tell the, the, the congregation, they tell the church gathering to select seven men to go and do this other ministry. And so that's what being a deacon is. A deacon is simply put a servant, a lead servant, a minister. So when, when we say the word minister, we are using that word interchangeably many times with the word deacon or with the word servant. They all are interchangeable throughout the New Testament. And this brings me to today's big idea. If you've ever watched one of my messages, you know that I usually give one simple statement that summarizes the main point of that week's message. And today's big idea is this, serve selflessly and sacrificially. It's pretty simple, but let me say it again. Serve selflessly and sacrificially. Serving is actually one of our church's core values. You see, we have a mission statement and we accomplish that mission statement through four core values. Our mission statement is we exist to lead every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. That's exactly what is put on this wall right here. So we exist to lead every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus. And we do that, we accomplish this mission through four core values, believe, grow, connect, and lastly, serve. Serving, when we talk about serving, we're saying that we are committed to selflessly and sacrificially serving God and others in the church, in the community, and in the world. And, and maybe you're watching right now and maybe you're thinking, this service stuff sounds good. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I've been looking for my purpose in life. And if that's you, if, if some of this that I've been speaking about has been resonating with you, maybe the idea of serving widows and orphans or uh, helping others or, or being a servant and having a purpose in Jesus, maybe that resonates with you right now. And maybe you don't know Jesus. 
Maybe you've never begun a journey with him, a a relationship with him. Hear me clearly. If that's you, I want you to know this. Jesus was and is the one and only unique son of God. He came to this earth as a man so that he could die on a cross to save us, to rescue us from our sins. You see, our sins condemn us to eternal punishment. But when we begin following Jesus, those sins and that punishment is wiped away because it didn't end with Jesus's death. You see, Jesus died on that cross to rescue us from our sins. But on the third day, he rose from the grave, demonstrating, proving to us that he was the authority, the conqueror over sin and death. And he wants you to be rescued from your sins and rescued from the eternal punishment that awaits you. And if you wanna know more about Jesus and what he offers, uh, or maybe you're ready to make a decision, what I want you to do is, is one of two things. You can text the word changing to 94000, or you can always go to our website, fsbcs.org and click on the contact us page, reach out to us and we will contact you as soon as possible and begin a discussion and answer any questions that you might have about what a journey with Jesus actually looks like. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. But now we need to transition to asking the question, how are we serving. And it needs to be personal. So let me, you know, change that question to this. How are you serving Jesus? As I asked that question, if you had a hard time coming up with something, or if the something that you came up with doesn't actually fulfill the mission of leading every generation to the life-changing hope of Jesus, then you need to find a way to serve Jesus. You see, hear me clearly, Jesus created every person uniquely to serve him. There is something in your life that you could do to serve him that would bring you a fulfillment that you've never experienced before because you were literally created to do that one thing. And if you need help understanding what that is, reach out to us because we want to help you find what God has created you to do for him. So Jesus does not want our excuses. Jesus doesn't want our delays. You know, let me be very clear. Even those of you at home who are being isolated right now and you don't even get out to do even the most basic things, even you have a special purpose for the Lord. Let me give you two examples. Prayer. Prayer is literally one of the most important aspects to the health of a church. I would love to have prayer warriors just like you praying for the various needs and prayer requests and praying for the health of this church. That is a service that you could do for Jesus, your Savior. Uh, Another way that you could serve if you're isolated and at home is you could volunteer to do some at-home work for one of the ministries that we have here. Uh, There are always uh, administrative needs or phone calls or emails or, or whatever that could be done that you could help us with. So if you're not serving Jesus, Why not? What's the reason? You know, quite frankly, we are never given permission to retire from serving Jesus. We don't ever, we can't ever serve enough that we don't have to do it anymore because we've we've done enough serving. Remember, we serve selflessly and sacrificially. You know, quite frankly, our retirement from serving Jesus will happen when we get to eternity. (laughs) That's the way this works. We exist to serve him. 
So what are some opportunities that we have right now that you could serve? Well, we have tons of ministry opportunities. We have music ministries. We have prayer ministries. We have children and students. We have a very active uh, young adult and college ministry. We have a very active homeless ministry that meets every Thursday here on our campus. We've got our Bridge to Hope ministry uh, that we go and serve mothers uh, who are trying to put their lives back together. And so there are many, many opportunities available here at First Southern where you could serve. But let me highlight two, especially that I've mentioned. Again, there are always opportunities in children and youth and college and young adults and and worship and, and all of those. But let me highlight two ways that you can serve that could really make a big difference in the lives of those who need to hear about Jesus. Every Thursday, Here on this campus, we open up our fellowship hall to our local homeless community. We call it our day respite center. And basically we open up our fellowship hall so that the homeless in our community can get out of the heat. They can rest in our air conditioned building. We feed them, Uh, we, we give them resources, we give them internet access so that they can take care of some of their needs. Uh, We play card games with them and watch TV with them and, and just talk with them. And we need people like you to help serve in that ministry. We're going to have a training coming up here in a couple of months. Uh, And I want you to be praying about whether or not you should go through that training and begin serving, whether every Thursday or on some kind of rotating basis on Thursdays. Um, Pray and think about whether you're supposed to be serving our homeless, our needy, through our Homeless Day Respite Center here at First Southern. The second ministry that I want to highlight today, an opportunity that you could serve, is our Bridge to Hope ministry. Bridge to Hope is a nonprofit organization uh, closer to Central Phoenix where they take in homeless mothers and their children and they help them put their lives together. They provide job training and accountability and a, a family. But one of the things that they do that is unique to Bridge to Hope and is wonderful for our church is they surround each mother and child, child or children with a church group, a church team. Uh, the team is made up of eight people somewhere around there, a few more, maybe a couple less. And that team helps take care of that mother's needs and helps get that mother to church and back every Sunday. And we need to put a new team together here at First Southern. And so maybe God's calling you to dedicate a day where you could help a mother and their child to go to an appointment or help a need, or come to church and get back to the Bridge to Hope apartment complex. I want you to pray about whether or not Bridge to Hope might be the way that you serve Jesus by helping a mother and their child or children come to know Jesus by loving them and helping them in their time of need. And so pray about those two ministries, our Homeless Day Respite Center and our Bridge to Hope team. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about both of these ministries in the coming weeks and months because we need to put teams together for both of these ministries. So be thinking and praying about that. But let me conclude with this. How is God calling you to serve him selflessly and sacrificially? If you can't answer that right now, I want you to spend time in prayer this week, asking the Lord what he's created you to do. And again, if you would like some help kind of processing through what God has created you to do, reach out to us here at the church and we would love to sit down either uh, over the phone or in person and help you kind of begin the process of understanding what God made you to do. But no matter what you decide, whether it's to come talk to us or you kind of have an idea what God has, has called you to do, whatever you decide, act. Every follower of Jesus is called to serve him. So go and serve him. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you 
We thank you for this example that's given to us here uh, from the early church of what it looks like to have a problem in the church that needs to be fixed and how to fix it. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for the example that you show us of how we're called to go and serve selflessly and sacrificially. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds and help us to understand what it is that you're calling us to do to serve you. That we would serve you selflessly and sacrificially today. Convict our minds and hearts and help us to understand that we have been created to serve you so that every generation can know the life-changing hope of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. And we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us here at First Southern. We are again so glad that you came to join us. And we do want to highlight one quick announcement that is happening here at our church. Uh, We have an Israel trip planned for 2022. It's going to be on April uh, 25th. Uh, through May 6th of next year. And if you're interested in going on that trip with us, we have uh, sent an email out to everyone on our mailing list uh, that had information and details and a full itinerary and cost breakdowns uh, of the trip. If you haven't received that and you're interested, reach out to us here at the office and we will get you that information. But please hear me clear on this point. If you're interested in the trip, The first deposit of $200 is due by Sunday, August 1st. So please take a look at your calendars, figure out whether you want to go or not, and get that deposit taken care of. If you want more information or you would like to register and pay your deposit, uh, you can go to our website, fsbcs.org, and click on the Events tab. Uh, You'll find uh, all the information there, links, and registration and a link to pay that $200 deposit. So uh, make those plans and make sure that you get that taken care of. Don't forget uh, to stay connected with us. If you're not connected to a group or if you want to know more information about our church or about a journey with Jesus, please reach out to us. Go to the website and click on the contact us page. Or again, you can always take your device and text the word CONNECTS to 94000. But, But please stay connected to the church family. So stay safe, stay connected, and stay strong in your faith. God bless and have a wonderful week.